Bueno, um, mi trabajo es en, uh, en inglés, uh, así que voy a presentar sobre la teoría de Tormes. Yo creo que todo el mundo ha escrito sobre la teoría de Tormes, esto es mi intento uh, en el tema. Uh, the, the title of my uh, work here is called Who do you think I am? La teoría de Tormes, and sort of, uh, the sort of the subtitle is La teoría de Tormes in the winter of his discontent. Uh, first, first published in 1554, the pseudo-autobiographical La Teoría de Tormes makes Lázaro's case a drawn-out explanation of why he has married the local archpriest's girlfriend. <laughs> Supposedly a successful pregonero, <laughs> or town crier, Lázaro occupies one of the lowest forms of public employment in early modern Spain. By contrast, his prologue uh, spins out a philosophical and idealistic lesson on the value of writing, reading, stories, books, and writers, citing both Pliny and Tulio in the process as he builds his own identity as a hard luck town crier. The anonymous author is openly daring the reader to unmask him, unmask him as the artist behind the fictional work. Yet the question, this is very ironic today, yet, yet, yet the, the question of who wrote the novel is irrelevant because the author worked to actively uh, preserve his anonymity. Any search for the real author would be based on the fact that the author was for some reason accidentally or incidentally anonymous and that by finding out who that person was, we could somehow better understand the novel. The author has concealed his identity because the novel is a politically subversive look at a socially dysfunctional authoritarian society that will not brook either criticism or scrutiny as it contends with poverty, homelessness, and hunger. By erasing himself from the narration, the author forces us to deal with the difficult issue of a nation's responsibility for its less fortunate members. Any attempt by literary histories and critics to reveal the author's identity is just a continuing part of the prologue's ironic game of revelation and concealment. The author reveals his presence only to hide it from us. By not recognizing that a game of hide and seek as the key to the work's severe irony, that is, Lazarillo and company are an illusion, we as readers are as blind to truth and reality as any of the characters in the story. When Lazarillo finally settles down and marries, he does it to create his own illusion of domestic and social harmony using what Gilman calls willful blindness. The author's auto-concealment brings us to one of Spanish literature's most polemic issues, realism as one of the main characteristics of Spanish literature, as if realism were a national asset. Yet, Lázaro de Tormes is not a realistic character, but one imbued with special talents, strengths, and insights. This paper will examine one man's singular life as he constructs his own identity and makes his case for the enigmatic Vuestra Merced through, through the use of a self-aware, socially critical narrative that questions its own rhetorical strategies and meta-narrative meta ideals. Lathro is a kind of ventriloquist dummy, a puppet, but we have no idea who is running the show. By the end of the novel, Lázaro has constructed himself as a successful pregonero or town crier, married to the local archpriest's girlfriend. Everyone knows that his marriage is simply a front from, from, from front behind which the archpriest hides his illicit love affair. As Alan Derriman suggests, quote, this is a story of corruption. Even if we do not believe that Lazarillo is innocent when the narrative begins, the story is told by the corrupted man that he has become, unquote. Lathero's telling of his own story will be biased, Derriman says, re re reiterating that, quote, the mature Lathero is corrupt, so his criterion judgments, judgments are corrupt too, unquote. If readers react in differing ways to the pseudo-autobiography, pseudo it is because they do or don't understand the nature of this corruption and the bias working to create a favorable identity, as it were, but with the reader. The very nature of the narration means that, that it is at once unreliable and untrustworthy. A life that is reduced, reduced to a string of anecdotes, amusing or pathetic, is biased, partial, and predisposed to favor in favor of the teller. The story that follows is the highly literary, the story that follows the highly literary prologue 
is one of penury and suffering, detailing flagrant child abuse and abandonment. As Blanco Aguinaga points out in his 1979 Historia Social de la Literatura Española en Lengua Castellana, the story of Lázaro is the story of the progressive corruption of one man's soul and life. Quote, Mas la historia de Lázaro es la historia de una corrupción, y esos apartes que ocurren de forma abundante en los, en los, en los tres primeros capítulos van desapareciendo pro, progresivamente conforme el nuevo tipo de héroe avanza en su descomposición humana, es decir, en su aceptación, que será absoluto, del esquema de valores de su sociedad y en su integración, unquote. The anonymous author subversively goes as far as indicting an entire society, which is to blame for Lathero's misfortune and suffering. At one point in the story, Lathero is a, is a homeless person who can only survive by begging or collaborating with con men, prostitutes, and criminals, which has always left me wondering if Lathero were not a prostitute himself, because he certainly is at the end of the novel, acting as a beard for the archpriest lover. Given Maslow's uh, uh, hierarchy of human needs, Lathero had to struggle to meet even his most basic needs of food and shelter, and hunger becomes a unifying motif that undergirds most of the novel. Born into poverty, his father, a corrupt miller, is arrested for cheating his customers and is shipped off as a conscripted soldier. From the very moment of Lathero's birth, there is a corrupt system of values in place in his home. The father steals from the sacks of grain that are brought to him uh, to mill in order to feed his family. But we need to realize that the father's wages are insufficient for supporting a family. Now, with no visible means of support, economic support, Lathero's mother must resort to prostitution to support herself and her son. Hunger is an issue, supplies are scarce, and Lathero's mother has an affair with a black stable hand who brings food, clothing, and blankets. It is easy to see how these people are trying to cope with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow published that in 1943 for the first time. <laughs> Just as Lathero will tell any story to justify his current state of affairs, Antona, the mother's, survival and penury means that all other considerations, legal and illegal, must be secondary. When the stable hand is caught stealing from the horses he tends, both he and Lathero's mother are prosecuted and whipped. Ironically and cynically, the horses live better than Lathero and his family. Lathero's domestic situation continues to decline and Lathero is farmed out or sold outright to a blind beggar con man as his guide. If hunger were an issue before, now the blind man has Lathero on starvation rations and staying alive is even more of a battle. Lathero's time with the blind man is a complete education in deception, violence, corruption, and dishonesty. The blind man keeps his food locked in a fardel or canvas bag, which is closed with a lock and key. Hunger pursues Lathero so persistently that he devises ingenious ways of stealing from the blind man and his method for, steal, uh, and his method for stealing wine, half, penny, half pennies and grapes are all a part of his survivor strategy. The adult Lathero who tells the story is weaving a tale in which he is a victim, justifying his necessity to cheat, steal and deceive. He has to steal to stay alive and his current adult authority figure, the blind man, is a corrupt con man that preys on the ignorant and uneducated. Since cheating, trickery, and fraud are the common currency of his existence, Lathero is in no position to turn around his life with the costly ethics of truth, honesty, and integrity. Quote, Digo verdad, si con mi sotileza y buenas manias no me supiera remediar, muchas veces me finara de hambre, unquote. Finally, the cruelty of the blind man, clearly a case of child abuse and perhaps sexual abuse, is too much for Lathero. And Lathero, victim of several incidents of sadistic violence, fights back by inducing the blind man to jump into a stone pillar, leaving him for dead. Uh, Lathero's next master, a priest, is, if possible, worse than the sadistic blind con man. This chapter centers on, a, on, on hunger in a very specific way. The bread that Lathero needs to survive is kept locked in an old chest, or symbolically arkat, by the priest, which much as the tablets of the Ark of the Covenant. Lathero, not much more than a slave, enjoys the daily rations of one quarter of an onion, 
which means he is slowly dying of malnutrition. The only uh, other times Lathro gets any food are when he gets the bones off his master's plate or when, his master, uh, or when he and his master eat at a funeral dinner, which leads Lathro to pray for the death of the sick who are visited by his master. Again, positive values such as praying for the recovery of the sick have become contrary to the hero's survival, declaring, quote, a cabo de tres semanas que estuve con él, vine a tanta flaqueza que no me podía tener en las piernas de pura hambre. Vime claramente ir a la sepultura, si Dios y mi saber no me remediaran, unquote. In three short weeks, foreshadowing the ritual death he will endure with the escudero in Toledo, Lázaro has eaten so little that he cannot even stand because of hunger. The corruption of the majorly priest is a little different than the blind man in that the priest does his job, but his priestly concern and Christian charity the that he extends to paying congregants does not uh, extend to Lázaro. The bread in the Arkath, a symbol of the Eucharist, just as the wine that Lathero stole in the first chapter was a symbol of Christ's blood, is locked up, and Lathero is denied the host by the very man who is supposed to give it to him as a symbol of Christ's sacrifice. The anonymous author is subversively criticizing the church in Spain, which was having a hard time coming to terms with the economic turndowns of Spain's 16th century and the growing number of homeless that inhabited large cities of the peninsula. Lathero must steal the bread of life or he will die, which turns into another example of the inverse value system adopted by Lathero in order to survive. Lathero, at least in the priest's eyes, is a dehumanized animal on starvation rations. Not only does Lathero chew on the priest's discarded bones as if he were a dog, the priest also gives his servant the gnawed on portions of bread that the priest will not eat, saying, quote, Comete eso, que el ratón cosa limpia es, unquote. Of course, Lathero is the rat eating the bread, and he will eventually torment his master by stealing and eating the bait out of a rat trap. A neighbor suggests that it might be a snake and not rats at all. Blanco Aguinaga underscores this process of dehumaniza dehumanization, stating, quote, y la deshumanización, la progresiva destrucción de la personalidad, y... Uh, y, este, y ese ostentoso yo con que se abre el libro, todo ello sigue una marcha paralela a la de la petrificación de los mitos del casticismo y a, y a la de la construcción de una sociedad cada vez más alienante y de un estado cada vez más burocratizado y omnipresente, el cual deja escaso o ninguno margen para la salvación de la persona. Unquote. Here the priest is not interested in saving Lathero, but instead he exploits him mercilessly. Lathero has moved down the food chain from person to dog to rat to serpent. A victim of violent beatings at the hand of the priest, Lathero is kicked out for being too cunning to work with. The third master, the Escudero, is but a ghost of a man who wanders about the city of Toledo, trying to look both important and busy. Lázaro explains that, quote, Topo me Dios con un escudero que iba por la calle con razonable vestido, bien peinado, su paso y compás en orden, unquote. A classic example from Spanish literature of the facade not matching the contents, the escudero pretends to be a man of means, but he is, ironically, poorer than Lázaro. The only thing the escudero really owns are his clothes. Lathero cannot believe his bad luck. He has gone from having a cruel master to a miserly master to a master with absolutely nothing. The mature Lathero narrating these events brings the string of masters to its crit critical climax, weeping, quote, Finalmente allí lloré mi trabajosa vida pasada y me cercana muerte venidera, unquote. The narrator brutally demonstrates the penury of the Escudero who crawls after Lathero who is eating some bread that he has begged in the streets. Lathero shares with his hungry master, but he rapidly eats what he has so that the Escudero won't want more. Lathero's situation is so dire that he stoically states, quote, contemplaba yo muchas veces mi desastre que escapando de los amos ruines que había tenido y buscando mejoría, Viniese a topar con quien no solo me, me, no me mantuviese, mas a quien yo había de mantener, unquote. The Escudero not only cannot support Lázaro, but now Lázaro supports him. Even the bed is hungry for lana, 
and Lazaro cannot, cannot sleep because his bare ribs are lying on the bare ribs of the bed or the bare ribs of the escudero. Lazaro actually feels sorry for the escudero and says, Dios, quote, Dios es testigo que hoy día cuando topo con algunos de su hábito con aquel paso y pompa, le lastima con pensar si padece lo que aquel le vi sufrir, unquote. During the course of about a month, the two go days without eating, and in the end, when the rent is due, the escudero quietly slips away, leaving Lázaro to fend for himself with the bill collectors. The fourth tratado is very short and enigmatic, as if discussing any of what happened with the fraile de la Merced would not help his case. The difference between the third tractado and the fourth, however, is marked and the hunger and corruption of the first three chapters have changed Lazaro so, to such an extent that corruption is now commonplace for him. The strange and corrupt ways of the fraile appear normal in Lazaro's world. The fraile appears to be a sort of male Celestina, one of the great Celestina uh, experts right here, spending his time on social sexual visits of one kind or another. What the narrator says is suggestive and ambiguous, but it does speak to the absolute poverty of Lázaro who gets his first pair of shoes, which is perhaps a symbol for a sexual awakening. The fifth chapter has nothing to do with the false buldero, has to do with the false buldero and tells a very straightforward story of how the buldero and his company of mischievous con men pull off the con of the false bula, reminiscent of Chaucer's partner, the Buldero has, uh, has developed a net of co-conspirators who work together to trick the townspeople out of, the mon out of their money by staging a phony miracle in one of the local churches. And all of the local officials, priests, mayors, sheriffs are all in on it. The sad reality of the situation is that all of the local officials, both religious and secular, are corrupt. The, inst the institutions are rife, with, uh, are rife with corruption, dishonesty, bribery, sleaze, and fraud. Lothero offers his narration with no sense of criticism because it seems like business as usual for him. It is only after he has hit rock bottom as a member of a gang of con common criminals does he be begin to search for another sort of life, which he finds in the sixth tratado as a water boy driving a mule and distributing fresh water throughout the city. Yet, as Blanco Aguinaga suggests, this chapter also recounts the integration of Lázaro as a participant in that corrupt society. Quote, el capítulo 6, con ser tan corto, es el más significativo, pues aquel en el que Lázaro manifiesta sin ambaje su deseo, nunca ha confesado antes de ahora, de integrarse en el sistema de mitos de la época, comenzando por, el, por lo exterior, jubón, sayo, capa y espada, para me vestir muy honradamente de la ropa vieja, unquote. In other words, Lathro accepts the spurious myth of looks versus reality, exactly what he has criticized earlier in the figure of the por escudero. The evolution of Lázaro is complete when we hear that he is now a town crier or pregonero and married to the mistress of the local archpriest. Lázaro has no illusions about the fidelity of his wife, but he is not interested in either her fidelity or revealing the truth of their relationship, which he understands. This is El Caso about which he has written his life story. Word has gotten around to the anonymous Vuestra Merced who is now asking for an explanation of the situation. The pseudo-autobiography is then an explanation of some of the events leading up to the current situation in which Lazaro has solved his issues of hunger and the associated items on, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Lazaro can live with the situation because having honor, a trait he abhorred in the Escudero, is not something he can afford. As Blanco Aguinaga suggests, well, Lázaro no solamente ha sido asimilado por el sistema, sino que se ha convertido en pieza, por mínima que sea, de la ingente, gigantesca maquinaria del Estado y de su ideología, unquote. He sacrifices his honor for having a roof over his head, food on his table, and a wife to share his bed. According to Lázaro, this sacrifice has come at a high price of mistreatment, starvation, and exploitation. He has eliminated his first, he has eliminated the first two of those problems. 
Exploitation seems to be a small price to pay for living well. Lathrow is finally about how a society corrupted, and the euphemism here is educates, and consumed, indeed in, induced a young person to want to join its materialist, superficial, and hypocritical society. Thank you.